Good afternoon. How are you guys doing? My name is Shakira Hawthorne. I'm the health educator with Bay County Health Department. Today I have the pleasure of introducing my great friend, um, Mr. Joseph Ward. He's a health educator at, um, in Leon County. And he will be presenting the sexual violence um, presentation. And I hope you guys enjoy Mr. Joseph Ward. Appreciate it. How y'all doing today? Good. 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 First of all, thank you all for having me here and, and bringing me down to Bay County, all the way from Leon County, so I can get out and breathe a little bit. Um, part of my presentation, what I want to convey is men are becoming a part of the solution to sexual and domestic violence. And I want to be able to give you information about sexual and domestic violence that you can actually use in your everyday life immediately to help make changes within your environment but also information that you can give others that they can help change their environment. Um, as I, uh, I'll give you a little background about myself. I started working in sexual and domestic violence five and a half years ago. Um, I actually created the, the, the sexual violence prevention program for the Leon County Health Department. Then I became active with uh, an organization called MOST. MOST, is, MOST stands for Men of Strength. And it's a collegiate arm of Men Can Stop Rape. Men Can Stop Rape is a nationally recognized organization based out of Washington, D.C. that works specifically with men on dealing with the topic of sexual and domestic violence. Um, all of the information and the trainings that I've taken have brought me to this point, and I just do my best to make sure I give you information that you can use immediately, information that you can spread to others. So I'll uh, move forward with my slide. Um, Break down what sexual violence is. A lot of times people have ideas of what they think sexual violence is, but I want to kind of give you a definitive definition of what sexual violence is. It's unwanted touching and words and actions from one person to another. There's something called consent. If consent is not given to take this certain action, then according to the law, especially if it's a sexual action, according to the law, then that person is committing a sexual violent act. It could be sexual assault, it could be sexual battery. Under the Florida statutes, it's considered sexual battery. I know a lot of times we use the term rape, and rape is a proper term, but it's not necessarily a legal term. It's more so sexual assault. So that, in that sense in itself, I, I like people, especially in the state of Florida, to understand that our verbiage and language and the information that we use want to make sure it's accurate. So when we're discussing sexual and domestic violence issues, especially when we're talking about prevention of sexual and domestic violence and dealing with people who have been assaulted, we want to make sure that we can give them the correct information that they can use so they can actually help themselves. Uh, <coughs> unfortunately, we live in a society that has, um, that's male dominated and it's saying, it says that men are above all, which I don't agree with. Um, you know, I've seen a lot of women, uh, fantastic women throughout my life who contribute a lot to my life and to society, period. So I don't necessarily disagree, but I, I understand the culture that we live in. The culture that we live in says that men are dominant and women aren't. Uh, I'm working myself to Ch to challenge that, to challenge our social and cultural norms so that we have men actually <coughs> respecting women and not objectifying women. Another definition is sexual coercion. Sexual coercion is using your power or whatever force you have to manipulate someone into doing a certain action that they don't want to do, but you want that person to, to do that act. So you'll use whatever power or whatever, whatever you have to manipulate this person to actually do these actions. That's information that I like to get out to people all the time, let them know you don't have to do something just because somebody's hanging some kind of power over your head. Um, even, if, even if you resisting this certain person is gonna cause some kind of hiccups in your life, resist it. Speak up, speak out. Because if you are not speaking up and you're not speaking out, no one can help you. And we have to encourage more people to speak up. But when people speak up, we have to make sure that we're taking the proper actions to help them the way they feel is best for them, not what we feel is best for them. We can't force our thoughts and our actions on someone. We have to help them the best way we uh, feel that, that they need. 
Um, I've, I've heard of a couple cases of sexual coercion on the collegiate level as, as well as the professional level. Um, some of the things that I've encountered, uh, especially when I was in college, um, some, young, some young women who were attractive young ladies were in class with certain teachers who took advantage of the power that they had and used that to have sex or whatever with other young, with these young ladies and the young ladies always felt powerless. And that's something that I work towards on a daily basis, especially with women, the empowerment of women. We have to, especially with the young men that we work with on a daily basis, we have to spend our time empowering women and not using male privilege to dominate women. If we're not lifting our women up, then our society would never be a society, a healthy society for us to exist in. And that's what we're, we're moving toward, a healthy society. Because when we're dead and gone, we want our kids and our kids' kids and our children's children's children to be able to live in a safe, healthy world. So these are other examples of sexual violence, child sexual abuse, incest. Um, one thing that I'm finding out is the rate of child sexual abuse is kind of high right now. Um, there are a lot of young men and young women who are victims of child sexual abuse, um, child sexual molestation. And a lot of these children who are experiencing these live in the culture of what happens inside this house stays inside this house. And that's a very destructive mindset and it's a very destructive culture. And that's we have to challenge that. If we're not getting the, the, the victims of these events, if we're not getting them help, they will never truly heal. And studies have shown some men and some women, but more so men uh, who grew up in these domestic violence situations, these sexual violence situations, that if they do not get help or any counseling, then they themselves show those acts and those thoughts and those feelings on others. And that's when the cycle continues, the cycle continues, the cycle continues. We have a lot of people who feel like we can't challenge social norms. Social norms should be challenged, especially when the social norms are oppressing one group over the other. And those are things that we want to make sure that we understand and we're spreading to others, especially the generation that's coming up under us. They have to understand that, yes, we've made a lot of mistakes, but we want to we wanna give you a new way of, of looking at life, a new way of looking at relationships, a new way of looking at uh, men and women. Um, pornography, child, uh, violent and child pornography. I, tell, I have to tell 16, 17, 18 year olds, 13 year olds, often, you can't walk around with pornographic pictures in your phone just because somebody texts you a picture of this or that. Um, that's, called, that's called child pornography. And they don't understand that because the culture says, okay, I have these smartphones, I, this is basically a computer in my pocket, and I can pull up any, any and everything and send pictures here and send pictures there. And that's one of the things that is a problem. Uh, the pornography culture, pornography is raising our kids especially when it comes to topics about sex and things, and it's not necessarily teaching them healthy relationships. If we don't have healthy relationships, then we're gonna, we're gonna like, I, like I keep saying, we're gonna continue the cycle of violence. We're gonna continue the cycle of objectification. We're gonna continue the cycle of one group trying to dominate the other. If we look at commercial sexual exploitation, Paying for sex, strippers. We have a whole we have a whole counterculture that says um, men should be in these places, like strip clubs, for example. I'm not, you know, I'm not judging anybody, but these places help continue the idea of objectification. If if everything I learn about a woman is, I'm, I'm seeing her as an object, and eventually I'm going to treat you like an object. I will hold no value. And these are things, once again, we have to challenge. Women have value. Men have value. People have value. And when I don't see you as a valuable person, I'm going to throw you away when I get through using you. And that's why we have to challenge these cultures, the commercial sexual exploitation culture. Uh, I know in Tallahassee, I have to educate people all the time about the, the, the culture. 
It's a counterculture that a lot of people may not understand exists, but it exists behind closed doors. And once again, we have that. If, it's, if it happens inside this house, it'll stay inside this house. I've heard uh, stories. Um, I was doing an HIV test on the mother. And she came, she was asking help for her 16-year-old daughter who was being prostituted by a 19-year-old girl. And the 16-year-old daughter is riddled with syphilis. And the mother doesn't necessarily, at that time, the mother didn't know exactly how to help her child because she had a hard time keeping a hold of her child. The, the actual sex trade is, is rampant in these parts, and that's something a lot of people don't understand. Eventually, we, we connected this lady to services that she could use to help her daughter get her daughter off the street. But this 19-year-old girl is prostituting our other young girls. And we have men doing it as well, men doing it to other young boys. And these are some, these are things we need to challenge. These are things that are happening in our communities and we can no longer overlook them and say, well, just because it's not happening directly to me, doesn't mean we can't do anything. Just because it, it's not a personal attack now, doesn't mean it may not affect you later. So we have to be able to look at those things. The professional sexual exploitation. The inappropriate use of actions and words within the professional setting. Um, we have to, I know at the health department things, we have to do our sexual assault trainings every year. And that's one of the things uh, I look at, especially in the presentations that I do, uh, the men's groups that I'm in, the women's groups that I'm in, sexual assault, sexual harassment. We have to understand boundaries and we have to respect boundaries, but it all comes back to that one thing, respect. And if somebody is willing to overstep their boundaries or your boundaries, that's because they lack of respect. And we want to make sure that we're teaching our young men and our young women to respect themselves first and then respect others. I, I, I encounter a lot of young women, unfortunately, who grow up in situations or environments where they may not have been taught everything that they needed to know to respect themselves. And their self-esteem is not where it should be, so they allow others to dominate them and manipulate them and control them. I had one young lady, at the time she was 19, self-esteem was not where it was supposed to be. She ended up dating a guy who was at least five to six years older than her. Since her self-esteem was not there, she never had those strong influences, she was in an unhealthy relationship. He told her that he had an STD. He told her he had chlamydia before he started trying to have sex with her. Then he convinced her and used the sexual coercion to have sex with her, knowing, knowing that he had chlamydia. And that in itself brought her self-esteem down even lower and lower. We, we got her HIV, her HIV test, we got her STD test, and she didn't have HIV. We treated her for the, for the syphilis. But the thing is, he comes from a culture of domination. He felt powerless and wanted to empower himself by using something or someone that he knew he could dominate. And that's one of the problems, that's, that's one of the cycles. It's a power and control thing. We have men looking for power and control in some women, but mostly men looking for power and control. So, who are the perpetrators? Anybody can be a perpetrator. We, there is no one face or one type of perpetrator. Perpetrators come in all many shapes, sizes, forms, and fashions. And no one should just overlook someone just because they look safe. There's no such thing as looking safe. If I don't know if you are a safe person, then I have to treat you as if, you know, you may, you could be a potential threat. This, this is the character I use. This is Mr. Herbert the Perp. He is a character of the show South Park. One thing about him is he is the, the old man in the neighborhood. He's not strong. He's not a threat. He's not physically intimidating. But he's always luring young men and young girls into his house, but specifically young men into his house so he can try to take advantage of them, use power and control. When we're, when we're talking about power and control, we're not only talking about physical power and control. We're talking about psychological, emotional, economic, mental. All these different uh, aspects of power control are used when one group 
or one person to dominate another group or another person. And that is what has to be challenged. Because it's a cycle that's going to continue to run unless someone or something or groups of people challenge it directly. And if we continue to just let it pass, we'll be here another 50 years from now still uh, with the same rhetoric wanting to stop sexual domestic violence. Anybody can be a victim. Uh, I was watching the TV show, What Would You Do? And they had a, a little scenario. There was a woman who was, petite woman, maybe 110 pounds. And the scenario was, she was on a date with a guy maybe uh, 150, 200 pounds bigger than her, 6'5", 300 pounds. He would go to the bathroom, and she would pretend as if, with the scenario with the TV show, put something in his drink. As she puts something in his drink, he, he passes out. So this is a small person taking advantage of a large person. Now, when we, when we normally think about you know, the, the, the violence and attacks and, and coercions and who could be a victim, we mostly only think about small, innocent people who could be victims. A victim can be any one at any time. They're all type of date rape drugs. That's why one, one of the things I like to tell people, college students, you know, I, I've been to college, I had fun and all these things, and I did a whole lot of things I wasn't supposed to do. So now I'm alive and safe, I can tell you not to do these things as well. Be careful about the drinking and, and whatever thing that you're indulging in trying to uh, experience the college experience. Um, one in four women in college experience the sexual assault. That's one in four. So if you count people in the room, if you just go across, <laughs> just, just think about it. when you're going across campus sometimes and you see women and you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And every, every fourth person you, you come across, you see that number increase and increase and increase. So some of the, some of the things have to change. Now, it's unfortunate that we try to put women in a box. Women have to live in the box of things that you can't do. You can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. And a lot of the teaching and a lot of the information that, 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 that is given out to prevent sexual domestic violence stuff is directed towards women, telling women what they shouldn't do, instead of information that being directed toward men and being able to actually stop the, stop the problem. Most, 85% of domestic violence are men are the perpetrators. Fifteen percent women are the perpetrators. So eighty-five percent of domestic violence are men. Then we need to focus on men, and we need to concentrate on doing things and activities and, and changing the culture within men, so these sexual violent actions, domestic violent actions, can cease. And if we only focus on telling women, well, you can't walk outside with, with your legs showing, and you got to zip this up, you got to zip that up, you have to, you know, basically put on an astronaut suit and walk down the street. But that's, you know, we've, we've had examples of men raping women no matter what they had on. This is about power and control. This is not about, hey, I see someone, you look good, I'm going to have you. It's more about power and control, uh, personalities. Um, all, all, all these things go into it. Um, this is a scene from the movie Pulp Fiction, and I put this picture up because it has Ving Rhames, who, if you know Ving Rhames, a big, strong man, and Mel Gibson, an action hero, two big, strong men. But in this actual scene, um, they were bound and gagged and basically raped, especially Ving Rhames, who was bound and gagged and raped. And this is an example of anybody can be a victim. Shaq can walk in right now, seven foot two, three hundred and sixty pounds, and be a victim. Or somebody four foot five, one hundred pounds can be a victim. So we can't continue with the normal mindset of only these people or only these people can be victims or these things are only gonna happen to a certain group. We have to be mindful about everything. Eighty-five percent of sexual assaults are committed by uh, persons that the victim knows. So the acquaintance rate is high. And those are things that we have to look at. I know in Tallahassee, uh, Florida State University, they have something called the rape trail. 
And it's unfortunate that we still call it the rape trail now, 2015. But it's called the rape trail. And the rape trail is basically a jogging trail that young ladies jog, and men too, they jog, but they call it the rape trail because there have been incidents of women being raped while jogging that trail. Now, when we're taught about sexual assaults, especially domestic violence, we're taught that those are the highest percentage of the rapes, of the stranger rape, but it's mostly acquaintance rape, because you can think about it. If I have access to you, it's easier for me to get to you because of the access. If I'm trusted, then it's easier for me to get to you because I have access. Anybody can be a victim, especially if I have access to you. We have, um, we have examples all the time of 70-year-old women who are attacked either by strangers or, or people they know who are now victims of sexual assault and domestic violence. So the victim can be anyone. Let's not overlook anybody. So let's get into our dating violence and our domestic violence. Right? So, there's a pattern of behavior that, that, that continues to go, that continues to go, that continues to go, and it affects the ones who have no idea about this pattern of behavior. So one of the things I take upon myself is to make sure that we educate everyone on these patterns of behavior. Any behavior by a dating partner which can be used to manipulate, control, lower self-esteem, potentially harm or scare, isolate. These are tactics that are going to be used by somebody searching for power and control. Um, I was at a, an event and this, this lady was telling us about her domestic violence situation. She was married to the man of her dreams. He was a pastor of the town that they lived in. They were, they were in Miami. He was a pastor. And this is the man had the stature that she was always looking for. The relationship was starting to turn. He was taking more power and taking more power from her, taking more power and just, you know, imposing his will upon her. Things came to, well, the first physically, uh, physical encounter came when they were at a dinner in front of friends. She said something to him that challenged his authority and he smacked her in the face. Now, he, knew, he already manipulated her he was already in control. He was already constantly working on her on a daily basis to lower her self-esteem. He used isolation to gain power and control. She was from New York. She had a strong family structure. He took her from New York to Miami, a long way from her family structure, a long way from the people who could actually help her. And he used the tactic of intentionally scaring and harming her. So with, those, with all these things into play, after he assaulted her, she was afraid to call for help. She was afraid to reach out to her support system because of the tactics that he has used. Isolation is a strong tactic. Using, using uh, um, those manipulative tactics, if you do this, I'll do this, or it's your fault that I did this, or well, every time you do this, you make me feel this. And these are, are, are tactics that people who are searching for power are going to always use. Um, there are three, three different types of abuse. Uh, physical, which physical abuse is usually the, the culmination of. Psychological and emotional abuse, sexual abuse. So physical abuse, put this picture popular picture, Chris Brown and Rihanna, they, that's, that's one situation people know about and understand. This situation didn't just start out with those two just punching and kicking each other and fighting each other. They were in an unhealthy relationship from the beginning, and that's something that was overlooked. They, neither one of them knew the components or the elements of a healthy relationship, and they could not, they could not, you know, um, articulate or even or even understand what was going on in an unhealthy relationship. Think about it. Unhealthy relationships have become the norm in our society. It's become the norm uh, when well, they put it in our heads, especially my generation, when they're teaching us about romance. So you go have a fight with somebody so you can passionately make up. I don't have to fight with you to show you passion. 
But since you were since you were constantly going to teach me that things have to go bad to go good, then we're always going to look for things to go bad to go good. That's not romance. That's not love. That's not a healthy relationship. A lot of us are not in healthy relationships with ourselves or others. Punching, kicking, pushing, shoving, biting, throwing objects, using weapons, date, rape, drugs, all of these have our tactics of, of, and things that are going to be used in physical abusive relationships. I have heard plenty of stories of young women or um, some young men using date rape drugs on their own partners because you are not having sex with me when I want you to have sex with me, so I'm going to put a little bit of this in your drink, put a little bit of this in your food, so after you consume it, you're out and I can have my way with you. That sounds harsh and horrible, but it's the reality. And what we have to do is face our reality. Understand that when, we, when, we're, when we're facing it, we're facing it with the mindset of change, prevention. Primary prevention is dealing with behaviors before they happen. We don't, we don't want to wait till, till somebody is raped again before we actually you know, get a task force together to go do something. We want to deal with behaviors before anything happens. That's primary prevention. Emotional abuse, talking down on one, using your words to manipulate and control these people. If I'm with someone every day for two, two years straight, and every day I'm going to tell you how bad you are, I'm going to point out every bad thing you did, every little thing you did, everything that you've done to in my mind to set me off, which is not true because uh, the, the perpetrator is always going to blame the victim. It's your fault that I hit you. It's your fault that I'm mad. It's your fault that I didn't go to class, so I flunked, I flunked class because I had to stay home and look after you because I don't trust you, which all goes back to low self-esteem of the perpetrator. Emotional abuse. Um, the last training I was at, uh, a lady, she, she went through emotional, psychological, all of these types of abuse from my husband before he started actually putting his hands on her. One thing he would do for the psychological and emotional abuse is while, while he was abusing her, he would have the oldest son to film. And the oldest son is always, always, always filming this situation. And let's, the, the, the longest tape they had, the longest one, was a 90-minute film. And you can just see the whole time the man is, is talking down on her, hitting her, talking down and hitting. And it got to a point one time where the young boy couldn't bear it. So he turned the camera away from the mother. And just you could just see his feet for 15 minutes, but you could still hear in the background how the father was you know, beating the mother and, and, and abusing her. All, every, every type of abuse he was doing to her. Now, well, what was significant about this situation is that 90-minute film was going to only get that husband a misdemeanor charge, maybe six months in, in jail. Mm -hmm. What got him convicted was her coworker. She had a coworker who was actually paying attention to her. She come in one day, her ears bruised. She come in the next day, she has a black eye. She come in one day, her lip is busted. So the coworker was actually taking notes. She pulled out a calendar. On this day, I see this. On this day, I see this. She had a, a year's worth of information that actually got him the biggest uh, domestic violence uh, sentence ever. He got 35 years in the state of New York for the uh, domestic violence that he was doing on his wife. Now, the psychological effects, she is still damaged from that, as well as the kids. They had three kids. It was the, the oldest daughter, the oldest one was a daughter, and the daughter was the daddy's girl. So he used all of his power and manipulation to get the daughter on his side. And so now the mother and the daughter are still trying to reconcile their relationship. The two sons who witnessed it, especially the son who filmed it, they, they have to go to counseling on a daily basis. That's something we often overlook when we're talking about sexual domestic violence, counseling. People need counseling after they go through traumatic situations, and we have to make sure that we are being sensitive and empathetic, and we can't be the ones, well, why don't she just leave? Well, you don't know all the parameters of the situation. Everybody can't just leave. 
It's not like that. One of the one of the famous ones is the Ray Rice situation in the NFL with him and his girlfriend. And everybody's, well, why don't she just leave? We don't know all of the details of the situation. And maybe, maybe they're working it out. Hopefully he's getting counseling, hopefully she's getting counseling. But if she needs to leave, hopefully they have the right resources around her so when she's ready to leave, she can leave. But we can't, nobody's ever gonna leave on our terms and our time because we think it's wrong. We're only looking from the outside in, but we're always available for help, and that's the thing. We have to, we have to curb this bystander culture that we have. The, this culture of, okay, I see something going on, but I'm not gonna do anything about it because it's not my business. That's, that goes back to whatever happens in this house has to stay in this house. That is, that, that led to where we are today in America where it's like a volcano. All of these things has been bubbling for a while and it's starting to come to a head. And women, are I don't blame you. Stand up. Stand up and stand out. Do not allow this culture to continue. It is hazardous, it is harmful, and it's time to put it to bed. Sexual abuse, taking advantage of someone in a sexual manner, whether it's molestation or whether you're actually penetrating this person. Sexual, sexual abuse is, 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 is happening. It's happening a lot and it's happening more than we want to know or more than we believe it is actually happening. And we have to be active allies. Um, I, I challenge men all the time. Matter of fact, I challenge I challenged this, this young lady earlier this week, who and a, and another young man earlier this week. Their mindset, their mindset was, a woman deserves to be raped, it, especially if she has on a certain outfit or she does a certain thing. So this is the this is the, the the thing that we have to challenge. This is the mindset that we have to actively challenge. When somebody says a person deserves to be raped because they wore a certain outfit, okay, that that that's totally wrong. I mean, because let's let's think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. So you're saying, all right, our culture says a man can walk down the street because we see it all day, every day. We see men walking down the street, no shirt on, and my pants are going to be sagging to the bottom of my kneecaps. So you can see, so everything is exposed and I'm walking and nobody tries to violate me. But if I'm a woman and I'm showing the, the slightest amount of skin or something, if somebody violates me, it's my fault. That's, that's false. I mean, that's, that's, we got to put that to bed. We have to put that to bed and I'm, I'm sad to say, that, that, those are mindsets that men are recycling over and over and over and, and men are teaching their sons, they're teaching the other men around them. And if I don't have a positive male influence in my life and I'm getting my ideas of manhood from the TV, I'm gonna to be totally off. Nobody ever deserves to be taken advantage of. And the people who say things like this, all you have to do is make that situation personal to them and their mindset will change real quick. Say, okay, so if your mother was walking down the street in a tight outfit or a revealing outfit and somebody assaults your mother, do you think it's okay? Real quick, like, no, that's not okay. That's my mom. I love my mom. I care. Right. So how about you show that same love and compassion for everybody else? Because if we did that more often, that would curb a lot of these sexual and domestic violence situations. I'll give you another example. Um, I was watching a DVD from a training that I went to from a call to men. They asked, they asked two questions. They asked the men, if you saw a man beating his wife and you were walking down the street and you saw that situation, would you jump in and help? Or would you do anything? All the men said, no, 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 I would not help. That's his property. That's not my business. That mindset right there, that's his property. That's not my business. There's something wrong with that mindset. Now, when they flip the question, if you see a, if you see a man abusing a random woman, would you help? Yes, I would jump in and help a random woman because no man has the right to put his hands on a woman. And one of the guys kind of caught himself when he was saying that, okay, a man can abuse his woman, but he can't abuse another woman. It's not the same, but it is the, then he caught himself, it is the same. 
It's the same mindset. We have to get away from that. Nobody owns anybody. The, the concept of property has to that has to go away. I mean, literally, this is America. Let's 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 be honest. And this is 2015. New Delhi in India, New Delhi is the rape capital of the world. The culture over there is, it's probably one in 16 or, or, or two and however many women, they are, they are constantly raped, constantly raped. Now, we shine light on, on countries like that. We have, to, we have to realize every six minutes in America, every six minutes a woman is raped, every six minutes. Our culture is not that much different. We like to think our culture is, but it's not that much different. So this is the cycle of abuse. We have a honeymoon period, a tension building period, and an explosion period. So when we're talking about these relationships, the, the honeymoon period is when everything is okay, everything is fine, everything is dandy. I love you, you love me, you're meeting my representative, and I'm not showing you my real person. But we're slowly getting to this tension building stage where the real me is coming about. Every little thing you're doing is ticking me off because I have never worked on myself. This person has never gotten counseling. This person has never improved himself. But in the tension building stage, arguments are starting to, to arise. Every little thing that the one or the man does, the, person, the other person is getting mad, it's getting mad, it's getting mad, and it's building like a volcano. And then the explosion stage. Where all the rage comes out, whether it's verbal, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's financial, it's coming out. But usually, usually, the studies show, usually, it always ends up in physical abuse. It's usually ended up in physical abuse, but it still comes back to this one weak person looking for power. It's a power and control battle, and this weak person sees that, they see, they see their victim as an object as someone who I can take control of and I can dominate and I'm going to dominate this person as long as I want to. Because these same people who, who, who are the perpetrators will tell uh, the victim or tell the girlfriend or the boyfriend, no one else will, no one else wants you. No one else will ever try to have you. You have two kids and no one will want you. But yet this person is not going to leave that person. But yet, we're still in love. You're still working to maintain control in this relationship. So that all goes back to that person realizing that they have no power and control and they're looking for it in an unhealthy manner because they have an unhealthy relationship with themselves. Oppression. One person is going to be oppressed in an unhealthy relationship. You, when you, whenever you have that power struggle, you're going to have that. So that's the exercise of authority or power in a burdensome, cruel, or unjust manner. I'm going to use all power and control to dominate every aspect of your life. I'm going to dominate your thinking. Um, I take you back to the, to the story where the lady, her husband was, was beating her and his sons was filming her. She could not go to the store across the street without her husband's permission. One of the things she said, she had a bad memory. And her husband knew, so he would use that to set himself off and, and further for further manipulation. He, she could not, she can only remember up to three items when she go to the grocery store. He would not allow her to write anything down, and, and he knew that. So he would give her three items to remember, send her to the store. Once she's at the store, he'll call her and give her three more items to remember. That's over her limit. She's not going to remember five items. She can only remember three. So knowing that she's going to forget some of these items, that's a chance for him to dominate her, beat her, and control her. And she's afraid now to leave the store. She's afraid to go home because she realized at checkout, I only have three items and I don't have six items. When I go home, I'm going to have to get it. That's a problem. Now, I'm glad he got his 35 years, and I'm, I hope they give him all the counseling that he needs, but that's classic oppression. Um, one of the saddest um, stories I ran into, and this and it kind of messed me up, and I still think about it because I, I encountered this when I first started the sex and domestic violence prevention. This young 15-year-old girl was raped by a friend of the family. She she was impregnated by that person and had a son. 
So not only is the friend of the family still around, but the thought of that act, she is, is, is there every time she sees her son because she's never received counsel. So that man is still using that power and control over her to, to manipulate her and get her to do things. Now, we did our best to contact her to all types of services and crisis centers, and hopefully she's using them. That's just another example of how people can be oppressed in their own relationships. You think about Ike and Tina Turner. Tina Turner was oppressed within her relationship. Even, from, even though people may look at her from the outside in and say, well, she had everything she wanted. She was oppressed within her relationship. This is the cycle of violence. This is the power of control wheel. Every aspect on this power of control wheel, the perpetrators use to gain and maintain power. This is all about somebody gaining and maintaining power and control over who they deem as weak. Intimidation. I'm going to intimidate you. I want you to be afraid of me. I want you to think twice before you make a move. I don't want you to empower yourself because if you empower yourself, then I will no longer be in power. So I'm going to use intimidation to keep you powerless. Emotional abuse. Every day, every waking moment, that person is going to take the time to tear you down. If somebody tells you for two or three years straight that you can't do something, you're not good at something, you're stupid, you're stupid, you're stupid. Depending on the self, especially if you don't have high self-esteem or you, uh, nobody has ever taught you how to gain, how to build your self-esteem, gonna, it's gonna start dwindling down bit by bit and that person has gained that emotional control. Isolation, as I said before, I'm gonna remove you from your safety net. I'm gonna remove you from your resources. So you have nothing but me. I'm all you have in this area, and without me, you're nothing. So I'm able to isolate you and use that isolation to further maintain our control. Minimizing, denying, and blaming. If you say something to me, uh, that's not serious. I'm gonna minimize all the stuff that you said. It's not my fault that I'm hitting you. It's your fault that I'm hitting you. I hit you because you came in the house two minutes after I told you to get in the house. Those mindsets, that's what I'm using for minimizing, denying, and blaming. Using children. Once again, with that story with the young man, um, with the man abusing his wife, and then he used the kids to film him abusing his wife. He used his kids to maintain power and control because he knew that his wife would do any and everything to make sure her kids are safe. He would, he would tell her, she said every day for two years straight, he told her before she left the house, when you come home, me and the kids might not be here because we'll, we're going to leave the country and never come back. Now, he was a musician and he had connections. And she knew that he had the ability to leave the country and disappear. That's how he used the kids. And whenever you come home, or if you come home today, I will be gone with your kids and you'll never see us ever again. That's using the kids out of control. Economic abuse. Once again, he didn't allow her to work. He, he finally, they were together 22 years. For 20 years, she didn't work. The last two years, he allowed her to get a part-time job. And she only bring in a certain amount of money, even though she was the breadwinner. And that's the thing. Though she was the breadwinner in the house, because he was, like I said, he was a musician who was trying to do it. She was the breadwinner, and he was controlling her, only allowing her to make a certain amount of money, because he felt if she made uh, more money than he wanted her to, that she could have the actual power and control of her own life. And that's not what he wanted because he wanted to maintain power and control over her life. Male privilege. Because I'm a man, I can do this. And because I'm a man, I can do that. And society is going to back me up. Our social and cultural norms, they have to be challenged. Being a man does not mean I get the privilege to just overlook you, to overrun you, to overbear you. None of those things. Being a man does not mean I'm in control. Being a man simply means that I have the male configuration and all that to be a man. That's what that means. Now, it means you are not to work together, but it doesn't mean I'm in control. Coercion and threats. 
I'm going to coerce you into doing what I want to do because I have the power and control. If you want to pass this class, well, I'm in control. What are you willing to do to pass this class? If you want this job, what are you willing to do to get this job? If you want to stay, you want to, to maintain a certain level of respectability, what are you going to do for me to maintain that? Coercion. It happens on many different levels. Um, that's something I saw a lot in high school but didn't know what it was. I thought it was just boys being boys. But let's think about that. That statement right there, what does that really mean, boys being boys? Boys, to me, boys being boys means it's okay for a man to violate women just because I'm a man. Boys being boys, because really there's no substance to that statement, boys being boys. It's a boyish, boyish acts from boyish mindsets, and people have to grow up. Let's go from boys being boys to men being accountable for their actions and their thoughts and their words, because we have to hold ourselves accountable, and women have to hold us accountable as well. Power and control, that's what people want. Every two minutes, one in, four, one in four women are victims of sexual assault or attempted rape. And that's, out, that's outside of the college campuses. On the college campuses, one in four is what? 60% of sexual assaults are not reported to the police. Um, with, with men of strength, we, uh, when we do our introductory meeting, I forgot which stat sheet we were looking at, but we pulled some stats from one of the databases, and they did a certain study on, um, in the city. And within this sample size and this group size, 85% of the men that were studied within this study admitted that if they could get away with rape, that they would do it. Now think about that. 85% of those men in that study say, if nobody's going to do a thing about rape, I'm a rape. Now you're saying 60% of sexual assaults are not reported to the police. So, that, so you're going to have a whole lot of men who have the idea of, I can get away with rape, literally. That has to be challenged. Justice system has to be challenged, but we need more people standing up and standing out. Across the board, all these things have to be challenged. We gotta make sure that we're putting the right people in the right positions of power. Because we know we can't have, we can't be trying to fight sexual domestic violence on one end, and then let's say this this person is an elected official or whatever, and they have the same mindset as the society that we're trying to challenge. That's not gonna help us, it's not gonna work. 84% of individuals raped are raped by a loved one or somebody they know. That's once again that acquaintance rape. You know, um, you, you have to be careful with relatives as well. You have to be careful with friends and family. There are a lot of stories of um, young girls and young boys spending the night at friends' houses and coming back being victims of sexual assault on molestation. You have to pay attention to those things. Um, I know sometimes uh, growing up, a lot of kids want to go spend the night at certain things and their parents tell them no. Sometimes the kid don't understand and the parent never really explains to the child why they can't spend the night at these people's house. After a certain age, you know, you have a certain relationship and understanding with your child, you should be honest with them. Hey, you can't stay at this house because this is not safe for you to stay at this house and this is why. You have to start letting people know about things that's going on. We can't hide, hide the reality of the world from uh, our younger ones too long because they're going to find out. And we don't want them to find out by actually being a victim. We want them to find out by, hey, these are things that go on in the world, and this is how we prevent them and protect ourselves. 80% of sexual assault victims are under the age of 30. I kind of started recognizing that when I, when I was first doing my classes, I was doing elementary, well, middle school and high school age girls and boys. I would be in a room full of girls, 10, 15 girls, between the ages of 13 and 15. And I would, and I would, would just be talking about it, and they would start revealing. And once they start revealing their life, at least half the room has been sexually assaulted. And we're talking about between the ages of 13 and 15. So after seeing that over and over and over and over, and it's only 200,000 200, uh, people in Tallahassee. They have to see it over and over and over. It's like, wow, wow. Something has to be done. The molestation rates, especially child molestation rates, 
uh, higher than they should be. Why are uh, why are these things happening? But remember, those those behaviors and attitudes were here 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. For for those ideas to not be here 50 years from now, we have to actively challenge things on a daily basis. We have to be active allies on a daily basis. And if we're not, then we're going to be here 50 years from now saying the same thing. 38% of women raped were between the ages of 14 and 17. 20% of women and 5 to 10% of men have, have reported being victims of child sexual abuse. The numbers are rising and we have to make sure that we're doing what we need to do to combat this. If a rapist report, there's a 58% chance of an arrest. Think about that. If it's reported, it's a 58% chance of an arrest. If an arrest is made, there's an 80% chance of prosecution. So a lot of these people know that, yeah, you may report me, but nothing's going to happen in the end. If, if there's a prosecution, there's a 58 chance of conviction. If there's a felony conviction, there's a 69% chance the convict will spend time in jail. So 39% of the attacks are reported to the police. There's only 16.3% chance the rapists will end up in prison. So people are getting off stock free. Factoring the unreported rapes, about 6% of rapists will ever spend a day in jail. 15 out of 16 rapists walk away free. Something wrong with that. That means we have done a, a horrible job of making our society as safe and healthy for our women as possible. Especially our women and our young girls and our young boys. We've done a horrible job in overlooking the things and the elements that we need to do to make our society safe and viable. We've become accustomed and desensitized to the violence around us. That's not normal. It's not normal to hear a story on the news that somebody has just been raped or snatched or something. You say, oh, well, somebody else? Again, that's not normal. We have to start taking active steps. The communities and things have to get together and do more than just talk about it. They have to get active and, and create safety nets for the people in the communities and things. That, and challenge it. If you know somebody is a, is a perpetrator, challenge it. Challenge it. Do what, you, do what you have to do. Gather as much information and evidence that you can to convict their butts and make sure you get them behind bars and they never get out. But then after that, go back into the community and educate people on how to prevent this from happening. Educate the family that says we have to keep our visions inside the house even though everybody in the house is suffering. There was a, uh, it was a situation in Gaston County. Um, there was a young lady walking down the street with a sharpened cop full of bleach. And uh, one, of the co one of my colleagues noticed that. She'd been working at HIV AIDS for a while. So she kind of pulled a young girl to the side and was questioning her, asking questions. Kind of found out the, the young girl was using the bleach as a protective barrier from HIV AIDS because that's what her grandmother taught her. But the kicker in the story was it was a grandmother, a mother, and a young girl, 16, and the, the man in the house was sleeping with every one of them and infected everybody with HIV AIDS. So he infected this young girl with HIV AIDS. And the mother and the grandmother knew that he was sleeping with her, keeping stuff inside the house. Not, and, and it's not safe, it's not always safe inside the house. Uh, I remember this young lady, this one young girl, I was trying to get her as much help as possible. Her mother was mad at her because she didn't want a prostitute to bring money into the house. She was only 14. So you want your 14 year old daughter to go prostitute and bring money inside the house because you don't want to go up and go work. So it's from both sides. It's from both sides of funds. Uh, it's mostly male perspective, but female perspective. But I also look at one look at this. What happened to our culture or what started in our culture for rapes and sexual assaults to be the norm? Now we do know Greece is the founding, is the foundation of uh, Western culture. Now Poseidon, Zeus, and Hades all were rapists. They were all rapists. Now this helped set up the society. This helped structure the culture of Western culture. We got the, the three head gods are rapists. 
the, the three head guys in the culture that you that you are within are rapists. Think about it. that's why the culture has that. So some things have to be challenged to change. And until people really look at those things, it's going to continue. Cultural norms, right? Rape has become a cultural norm around the world. It shouldn't be, but it is. Cultural norms are behaviors, patterns that are typical and specific to groups. Such behaviors are learned from parents, teachers, peers, and many others whose, whose values, has, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors take place in the context of their own organization or culture. I want to get to this picture. These are cultural norms somewhere. For somewhere, ladies walk around with the rings on their neck, it's a cultural norm. Now somewhere, somebody will say, that's wrong. They shouldn't be doing that. Maybe, maybe not. Somewhere in the world, it's a cultural norm to have this big plate in your lip and expand it. Some people say it's wrong. Some people say it's right. It's culture. Is it healthy or unhealthy? That's what we need to be challenging. Is it oppressive? That's what we need to ask ourselves. Not whether it's right or wrong. Is it healthy and is it oppressive? Now, somewhere in the world, this is, somewhere in America, this is a cultural norm. Pimping and prostitution is a cultural norm somewhere in America. And guess what? They show this is a picture from an award show, uh, one of the very popular award shows, and Snoop Dogg was elevated as he's the man. He's walking down this runway with his dog collar, dog collars around the girls' necks, and they got seated. I can see I had to put my block in front of my shirt. Because, you know, breast out with the dog collars around their necks. And so how do you how do you explain this to your sons? And they're asking you, hey dad, it, should I be doing this with women? How do you explain that? How do you counter that? See, these are things somewhere in America they said that this is okay. Somewhere. Now